tremendous military powers. And you can look at the US and say we spend more on our military than the rest of the world combined, but that's a little bit misleading that um, it's sort of like comparing a salary in New York with a salary in, say, St. Louis, that you could have a really high salary in New York, but still live quite poorly because prices are tremendous. Whereas in St. Louis, on a New York salary, you can go you know, own a very nice house or a couple of them. And, you know, um, and so yeah, the, the US, we spend a lot on the military compared to China, but you know, the Chinese cost of having military is quite low. And then, like the US, China looks for a lot of its military strength to the lower income parts of the country, and particularly the more rural parts. And uh, yeah, so China has tremendous you know, strength in terms of infant, uh, infantry. Um, they don't quite have our ability to project force, uh, but you know they, they are certainly a, a military power. And this concern about where does China get its sort of military power and and keeping those parts of sort of the, the country happy, that that is that is a very important thing. And so China. In terms of economics, we think of comparative advantage. The countries specialize in what they're most good at or least bad at. And China is a great power in manufacturing and actually in agriculture. That uh, there's certainly things like cotton and other crops that China is tremendous in that. And so the government of China is very keen on seeing that agriculture, agricultural exports and manufacturing exports continue to grow. And this continues to deliver jobs and increased incomes to the poorest parts of the country. The wealthiest parts of the country, that seems to be no problem. That um, you know, finance and consulting and sort of the higher tech things, that you know that that the role of government in there doesn't seem to be very important. That you know that's that's doing just fine. And that government is sort of very worried about managing the growth of incomes of you know, the poorest. And in many ways it's you know an incredibly noble Concern, and the thought is that exports are huge in that, and so to make exports continue to grow well, China can't see its currency appreciate too much, and so high demand for Chinese exports, you know, high demand for manufactured goods, you know, toys, pet food, clothing, um, high demand for Chinese agriculture, that that would be expected to appreciate the currency, and China is worried that if it did that that would sort of kill off this golden goose. It would slow up the growth of income for the poorest members of society. And so China has tried to go with a very slow growth of its exchange rate, trying to, you know, for a long time, keeping it pretty much undervalued. And you know, so that makes Chinese goods cheap in the rest of the world. Um, how does China do that? Well, if Chinese goods are cheap, that's going to be high demand for them, but it also makes imported goods expensive, so that's going to lower demand for imports. And so China runs these big trade surpluses, and again, primarily designed to try to preserve growth of you know, the poorest sectors of the country. So with this big trade gap between large exports and um, smaller imports, and this is particularly bilaterally with the US for whatever reason, that China actually has a lot of imports from the rest of the world, but the US doesn't make a lot of things that China really uh, wants to buy. An exception to that, happens to be places like Northwestern, that it seems that the product we supply is in high demand by a lot of upper income Chinese. And I don't know why, but I'm, I'm glad. Um, it does a lot for a student body. Uh, but to maintain this sort of mismatch between exports and imports, um, and to sort of keep the exchange rate uh, somewhat below par, China's had to acquire a lot of assets. So essentially, Chinese business sells a lot of things to the US, they get dollars for that, and instead of turning on buying goods and bringing it back to China, which would bring up the imports, which would be very expensive, um, they cash out those dollars sort of to the government, and so the government ends up holding a lot of dollars, which they then invest in US government securities. And US government securities, well, for a long time, I was thinking China was sort of missing a trick by doing that. The US government securities are incredibly safe, but they don't pay a particularly high rate of return. And that China might have done better to have a more diversified portfolio. Um, now China's looking pretty smart. <laughs> that uh, Super Professor Xi will talk about uh, the women that run the Chinese Central Bank and 
that, yeah, they have to be feeling pretty good about uh, their choices of late. Uh, that, uh, but China also faces a problem that if it wanted to diversify its holdings of dollar assets out of government securities into, well, into other things, they might get into the same trouble that Abu Dhabi got in a few years ago when they tried to um, invest in the port of Baltimore, that Americans got all upset. Oh my God, foreigners controlling our ports. Like, well, uh, you know, foreigners are good at a lot of things. They want to invest in Baltimore. I'm a big fan of the wire. I amaze anybody who wants to invest in Baltimore. It's great. Uh, but it is sort of a, it becomes a politically challenging and embarrassing thing when um, sovereign wealth wants to be invested in something other than government bonds. And so, it has been a challenging thing for countries that are trying to do that, and, um, and China has tried to engage with some investment house in the U.S. to to broaden its portfolio from uh, just government securities into you know broader industrial investments, and that's you know, that, that seems like a quite a reasonable thing. But uh, Geiger's complaint about China's exchange rate, well, it is just sort of an extraordinary thing that China, by managing the exchange rate in this way, yes, it has made it very hard for U.S. to export to China, but it's been a great thing for American consumers that you go to Walmart and you start looking where things are made, and they're made in China. You look at clothing, and you know, tremendous amounts made in, in China. And why is it so popular in the U.S.? Is it because it's incredibly fashionable? Well, maybe, but speaking as an economist to whom fashion means nothing, um, <laughs> It's because it's a great value for the dollar. And so the Chinese exchange rate policy has been great for American consumers. And uh, what is a bad exchange rate policy? Well, I mean, this has been great for American consumers. It's perhaps been bad for Chinese importers, people who want to buy foreign goods. Um, so it's a policy that benefits American consumers. It's tough on Chinese consumers. Um, it's a little bit tough on American exporters. But it's this great source of financing for the U.S. That, um, that to the extent that China is willing to sell us a lot of uh, imports um, very cheaply and finance it by buying U.S. treasuries, that's effectively loaned a lot of money to the U.S. Uh, consumer sector and a lot of money to the U.S. government. And so that's allowed us to keep low taxes and uh, you know, have a low savings rate and still have a pretty high level of income. And so this complaint about China's, ex China's exchange rate policy, um, well, the, the, the Chinese government's uh, response to Geiger's complaints was, well, you know, the, this is the flip side of the American budget deficit. And you know, that's, that's perfectly true, that, that China could never have acquired all these uh, US government securities if the US government hadn't been looking to sell so many of them. And the way to avoid having the US government sell so many government securities would be higher taxes or lower government spending, which we didn't want to do. And so yeah, this was just, again, an extraordinary complaint by the Treasury Secretary, but um, oh, far be for me ever to be cynical, but I guess if one is seeking uh, confirmation before the Senate, it is nice to complain about uh, things that don't hit anybody in their own district. So it's, when, you're, when you're trying to be confirmed as Treasury Secretary, it wouldn't be so politic to say, well, yes, we have to quit doing so much aid from the federal government to the states, or we need much higher taxes. It's, it's sort of much easier to say, oh, China with its terrible exchange rate policy. Well, so going back to my question earlier about what is a bad exchange rate policy, I mean, there are costs and benefits to what China's doing, but a bad exchange rate policy to me would be one that is jumpy, that what's hard to adjust to are rapid swings of exchange rates, and so China, found itself in a position where maybe by choice or maybe somewhat by drift, its exchange rate was below purchasing power parity, that, that you couldn't ver buy very much um, with Chinese currency compared to, um, sorry, my screens are jumping around here, um, compared to sort of what you'd expect uh, if, the, if it had been lift to freely float. And to get out of such a situation, it's really best to go small adjustment, small adjustment. That rapid swings in currencies, as has happened between like the English pound and the 